And then there is also uh, the aspect that this could provide a, mo a modular approach to, to tune the properties of the system. So uh, here we investigate two different capping groups, but by extension, you could think also of changing uh, the, the, the branches and so have different combination of branches and, and capping group uh, to, to tune the properties of the system uh, the way you want uh, to have them. Okay, so, uh, so with our calculation first, we, we had, a, uh, had a look at this uh, hypothesis about the conformational uh, restriction. And so taking the, the phenyl cage, uh, we, we, had a, we did a conformational search uh, taking only the, the phenyl monomer, which is the bityofin unit with uh, here these uh, extra rings, and, uh, and the, the cage itself. And what we found is that the, the conformational space available is much larger for the monomer uh, than what we obtained, uh, but we were able to obtain at least uh, for the cage. So, so this uh, architecture actually indeed reduces uh, the, the possible conformations for the, 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 the two systems. But then beyond the, the purely structural aspect, there is the, the reduction or possible reduction of the, of the conformational dynamics uh, induced by uh, the constraint that is imposed by the cage. And so, opa. Okay, maybe I should pass to the PDF. Uh, I don't know. This should be like a, but. I don't know. Do you want to? Yeah, I will pass it to the PDF now because I, I might have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, rotated. So, yeah, I will have a lot of rotated uh, plots, I think, and images. Do I go again? No, apparently there's no microphone, so there is no Zoom, there is nothing. Uh, how do I do? Sorry. Okay. Okay. So what we did to probe the the restriction, possible restriction of the conformational dynamics, is that we uh, simulate a thermal activation of the low frequency mode. So here we put a threshold, uh, two hundred uh, centimeter minus one, and so for for uh, for both systems, we take the modes below uh, this value and we redistribute KT equally in energy into this mode. We distort the geometry of the system along the normal modes and compute the, the vertical transition to the first excited state at the distorted geometry. Uh, and here I plot uh, the, the distribution of the, the differences uh, of the, the vertical transition energy to the first excited state to from like uh, the between the distorted geometry and the, uh, the transition computed at uh, a zero temperature. And so what we observe is that for the monomer, we have a much more uh, spread uh, distribution uh, if we compare with the cage where the distribution is pretty uh, narrow. And this tells us that yes, the cage actually reduces the, the possibility for uh, molecular uh, motion. Okay, so that's the, the structural uh, aspect but uh, what about the, the nature of the interaction of this uh, constituting chromophore of the cage? So given the, the architecture of the cage, uh, which is uh, schematically put there, one can think that the individual transition dipole moments of the constituting chromophore will align and form an H aggregate. And what uh, Kasha models uh, is telling us is that when you have an H aggregate, you split the uh, original uh, excited state of the monomer into two, uh, one uh, weakly allowed state uh, here at lower energy and one strongly allowed state at higher energy. And this is uh, what they observe if we look at the uh, absorption spectrum here. So in black of the cage in red of the monomer. And so they uh, get this blue shifted absorbance. They also have uh, uh, a shift, uh, red shift, uh, red shifted shoulder. Uh, also another sign that I forgot to put here is uh, another sign of H aggregation is in the emission spectrum when you have a loss of this uh, zero zero uh, vibronic peak. So uh, from the experimental point of view, there are signs that confirm that we might have a H aggregate like uh, situation within the cage. And so uh, from uh, the point of view of our calculations, well, we computed the uh, vertical excitation in the, in the phenyl cage, and uh, we have this uh, free uh, low lying state and we get something that is consistent with uh, H aggregation since we have the 
highest excited state that is the one with the highest oscillator strength, while the, the, the lower one is the, the weakest uh, state. Also, when we look at the, at the nature of these states, uh, we see that uh, they are uh, the interaction of uh, local excitation on the uh, distinct uh, branches uh, here of the, of the cage. Okay, so uh, all of this uh, also goes in the, in the way of having an edge aggregate, but we wanted to, uh, to investigate a bit further and try to disentangle uh, what was in this, and the, the, the photophysics of this cage is vertical excitation, what was the contribution uh, from uh, the disorder within the cage and the uh, electronic uh, coupling. So uh, to, to probe this, uh, we did uh, several uh, approximations. We made a step-by-step -step process. And the first step was to extract the branches from the cage and keep them at the, at the geometry that uh, they have within the cage and compute the, the vertical uh, transition to the first uh, excited state. And when we do this, what we observe is that uh, we have like a, a spread in the energies of the transition that are not uh, uh, all equal which shows us that there is some structural disorder uh, due to the different conformation adopted by the branches within the cage. However, we see that the, the oscillator strength uh, are pretty much the same and we do not have uh, this trend, this, uh, the trend that we have in the cage. But okay, this makes sense because uh, these are individual uh, molecules that do not interact. Okay, so from this, uh, we take uh, these uh, branches and we will turn on the uh, electronic coupling between uh, the branches using dipole-dipole uh, uh, interaction. And when we do so, we keep, uh, well, we recover even the distribution in energy of the, of the excited states, but we do also recover this trend of, uh, of oscillator strength with the weak and, and the strong uh, oscillator strength uh, here. And this uh, tells us that the, the CT contributions are are minor, like uh, the, the CT contribution from overlap between the, the branches are, are not playing a strong whole role here. And the, the next step uh, to probe this was to uh, do the same calculation on a non-bonded trimer. So this means that we take the cage and just remove the, the capping group. And uh, here we have, uh, again, the, the same trend, which is consistent with uh, exit on coupling uh, through space. So the, the picture of what's uh, happening uh, the, in the cage uh, regarding these uh, vertical uh, transitions is, uh, is that we have um, a complementary uh, role of the structural disorder and then the electronic coupling uh, to reach this, uh, this picture. Okay, so that's, uh, that's for the, the, well, basically the absorbing state. But then uh, what about the excited state uh, relaxation dynamics? So uh, we, we remain with the phenyl cage, and this is uh, the transient absorption spectroscopy that the uh, collaborators have been, have been uh, doing. And what they see here is that uh, there is a, a strong decay of the excited state absorption that comes with a rise here of uh, this double peak that they assign to uh, triplet triplet absorption. And when they look at the, uh, the kinetic decays at different uh, wavelengths, so uh, about here and there, I think, yes. Uh, they see that only one relaxation time is, uh, is uh, necessary to fit uh, the, the, the dynamics at these two different wavelengths. Also, here we know that uh, there is an isospecific point that tells us that only uh, two species are involved in the, in the relaxation. And so the picture that we get here is that after the excitation to the excited singlet state, there is an uh, intersystem crossing path to the triplet uh, manifold uh, that, that is open and that, uh, that, that, well, that actually happens. And uh, so that's the data they got for the cage, but they performed similar experiment for the monomer and they obtain the same picture. So in, in both cases, there is intersystem crossing. And uh, we can say that the, this phenyl cap is actually an inert spacer so because it, it doesn't uh, change the, the excited state uh, properties. Now let's look at what happens when instead of a phenyl ring here, we put a triazine ring. So if we look at absorption and emission uh, spectrum, well, we do have this uh, same picture with uh, the blue shifted absorbance and our calculations 
uh, tell us that we are again in this age-like situation. Mm -hmm. Here we have um, a little bit of a uh, city contribution, but uh, they are uh, really minor. And so again, we have uh, the, the upon absorption, uh, we create in this cage uh, an excited state that is neutral. However, in, in the case of this cage, uh, when you look at the fluorescence, here comes uh, a lot of, of differences. So basically, uh, from the monomer to the, the cage result, and is the cage with a different uh, solvent, uh, what we see is that we have a strong redshift. We completely lose the vibronic structure. The fluorescence is also sensitive uh, to solvent, like it's more shifted with the increased polarity of the solvent. And also, uh, which cannot be seen here because it's normalized, but they, uh, they see a, a, a larger fluorescence quantum yield uh, in this rising cage than they do in the phenyl cage. So all of this uh, suggests that the states that they meet has a charge transfer character. Uh, but, well, I just said that we create uh, initially a, a neutral excited state. So there, there must be something uh, going on in the dynamics. And so uh, when uh, we look here at the, the transient absorption spectroscopy, we see like a very different picture. We do not have anymore this uh, double peak uh, of the triplet-triplet absorption, but instead we have a rapid relaxation together with a, a shift in the wavelength but they do assign to a uh, charge transfer state uh, formation. So what's going on is quite different. And it seems that uh, after initial excitation, we will relax to a uh, charge transfer state. So we have been um, trying to find this uh, charge transfer state. And actually, uh, we got uh, at least three of them. And what we can see uh, in all of them is that they are uh, accessible in energy uh, at, uh, at lower energy than the vertical excitation to the, the first excited state. And also we see that they have a significant uh, oscillator strength uh, that, that goes with the, the fact that uh, we had higher photoluminescence quantum yield uh, in the cage. So all of this suggests that uh, the relaxation after the initial excitation to this neutral excited state uh, can allow then the formation of low-lying low uh, charge transfer state that, uh, that remain with significant oscillator strength. And if we do the same uh, search, but this time for the phenyl cage, well, we were actually uh, unable to find any low-lying city state. And the first one that we could obtain is much higher in energy. So in that case, uh, it seems that this uh, city pathway is, is, not, uh, uh, is not allowed, like is energetically uh, uh, forbidden. So, like that's a summary of uh, what we learned about uh, the system. Uh, so the 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 first uh, the, the the nature of the, the the absorbing state is determined by basically the the walls geometry and is a combination of contribution from conformational disorder and then through space uh, electronic coupling. But then the fate of the excited state is determined by uh, the the nature of the capping group that you have. And in the case of uh, the the phenyl capping group, well, we have uh, this inert spacer uh, that does do not change anything about the, the, the relaxation that occurs in the monomer. So here we have uh, easy intersystem crossing and uh, to the triplet manifold and uh, uh, poor fluorescence. But in the case of the triazine group, well, we, we open a new relaxation pathway, so the charge transfer one, uh, that allows to avoid this, uh, this rapid intersystem crossing and, and so we have uh, here like a uh, higher fluorescence. So um, yeah, that, that's the, the summary of, uh, of what we learn about this. And, and uh, it's like, it's one more step to understand uh, the, the possible uh, photophysics of, of uh, this kind of controlled architecture. And also it's quite interesting that, well, with this modular approach, one can think about well, changing the branches, so you would change, of course, the electronic couplings and and all this uh, all this picture probably. But uh, we it's interesting to see that we can have some chemical tuning of the excited state while remaining in the in the same uh, uh, overall geometrical uh, arrangement. And so now this is the the second topic that uh, I wanted to talk to you about. So we go. Uh, we stay with organic materials, but go uh, in, in another way, uh, we go to deal with uh, organic radicals. And so uh, these organic radicals are being uh, since very recently studied uh, for application in uh, organic light emitting 
uh, diodes. So uh, I will give like a very brief and simple overview of, uh, of the uh, history of uh, the development of OLEDs and, and how it's working. So that's a very simplified scheme of what's going on in an OLED. And here you have uh, the, the two electrodes where the injection of the charges take place. Here you have uh, a whole bunch of uh, electron and whole uh, injection transport layer. I mean, this part can be quite complex, but what we're interested in is this uh, emission layer here where the charges do, uh, do recombine. And if you uh, look at this more with a state picture, uh, when you have a recombination of charges, the uh, spin statistics tells you that you will obtain 25% of singlet and 75% of triplet. So the first generation uh, was based on, on uh, fluorescence and to avoid uh, losing even more singlet because we, we could just gather this 25% and to avoid losing some of them to the triplet manifold, uh, usually the design was made so was made such that the uh, the difference in energy between uh, these two is pretty large, so you can have only a small intersystem crossing and try to get to this maximum internal quantum efficiency of 25%. But then there's been uh, a lot of development to try to make use of, of, this, uh, of these triplets. And the first one was to use uh, phosphorescence instead of uh, fluorescence, so it was in the about 2000, and these are the kind of, uh, of systems were, that were uh, designed and developed. And of course, they contain this uh, heavy metal atom that uh, thanks to the spin orbit coupling uh, can promote a large uh, inter-system crossing. So somehow you, you could recycle the singlet and make use also of the triplet. So theoretically you can reach 100% internal quantum efficiency. Then the next generation, uh, was also to get rid of this uh, uh, heavy metal atom is what is called the TADF. So these are the thermally activated delayed fluorescence materials. Mm -hmm. And in this case, instead, we want a very small singlet uh, triplet gap uh, so as to promote the reverse inter-system inter crossing. And in that case, you could have uh, fluorescence and then delayed fluorescence also and reach, uh, again, the 100% uh, internal quantum efficiency. And so th these are the kind of, of systems uh, that, that are, are being developed. And finally, well, what I found, what is supposed the fourth generation or fifth, but I don't know, depending on the perspective, I guess, uh, it uh, relies on much more complex thing in which uh, they combine uh, several concepts and you have uh, complex uh, processes uh, one after the other. So somehow the, the, the problem that remains uh, here is that what, uh, what spin statistic dictates uh, means that it's really hard to find a compromise in the properties of the material well, to achieve uh, the complete recycling of the triplet uh, and, and, and reach this uh, maximum efficiency. So very recently, there's an idea that came out uh, that uh, instead of uh, fighting with singlet and triplet, well, what about using the doublet manifold? And so you get rid of the spin statistics uh, limitation and all these compromises that you have to do. And so uh, this could be done using organic uh, radicals. Uh, so in this guys, the ground state is actually a doublet. You have this uh, unpaired electron in the semi-occupy molecular orbital. And upon optical excitation or charge injection, or well, you can go to the excited state, which is also a doublet. And so then you have a spin allowed process when you have fluorescence from the D1 to the, to the ground state. Uh, so, the, the systems that are uh, being uh, currently uh, studied, uh, well, the most studied are these two guys, TTM and PTM. So the, because the field is quite recent, uh, the, the chemical space available is also uh, actually very, very limited. And so most of the work has been done, uh, well, with, this, with these two guys for the, for the time being. So in the following, I will focus on, on TTM. Uh, here you have this chlorine atom, but kind of, provides a bulky protection, protection to, this, uh, to the radical here. So th these compounds are stable. And so when we look at the uh, optical properties of, uh, of the TTM radical, uh, this is what we obtain. Uh, so this is the absorption, this is the emission. And what we see is that here we have a very weak absorption band at about 545 something nanometer. And here we have a, a, a stronger uh, absorption band at a lower uh, wavelength. Uh, also, if we look at the emission, we see that the photoluminescence quantum efficiency is, is pretty low. And somehow, well, that's kind 
of a problem for a system that is uh, being uh, envisioned as a candidate for organic light emitting uh, diodes. So um, at some point in 2006, yes, um, not with the perspective of uh, using them for OLEDs, but uh, a group was working into uh, modifying the properties of this TTM radical. And <clears throat> among the things that they did, they grafted a carbazole unit to the TTM radical and uh, when you look at the properties of this uh, donor acceptor system, what you see is that you have uh, here the absorption band that is shifted, yes, but beyond that, it's uh, getting uh, some intensity. Uh, and for the photoluminescence uh, quantum yield, we go up to uh, 53%. So it's like 20% increase uh, as compared to the, to the, what, the naked uh, TTM radical. And so this compound is actually the, First one that has been used in an actual functional device of, uh, of OLEDs. And so this was in 2015, and they obtained an external quantum efficiency of about 2.5. And only three years later, well, there's been like an intense work uh, in, in this uh, new field. Uh, and only three years later, uh, some, some, a group reported uh, the TTM radical grafted with this uh, donor group instead of simply the carbazole. And here they already reach uh, external quantum efficiency of uh, 27%. So um, this, this, are the, this is more or less the state of the art uh, in the field. And, uh, and the way that the photophysics of this system is uh, being rationalized is, is the following. So uh, TTM is, uh, belongs to what are called the alternate pi hydrocarbon system. So uh, this, in this type of system, you can take the, 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 the set of carbon atoms and divide it into two sets, let's say carbon A, carbon B, in such a way that you never have uh, carbon A next to carbon A or B next to B. So this is what I picture here using the, the, the stars. And you see that there are no two stars close to one another. And uh, there is a theorem that can be used uh, for, for this, uh, this alternate P, P hydrocarbons. And for closed shell system, it tells us that the homolumo distribute uh, symmetrically in energy. And if you extend this theorem uh, to open shell uh, alternate uh, systems, uh, you, you get this picture. So the homolumo distributes symmetrically with respect to the uh, semi-occupied molecular orbital. And so uh, uh, when you have this picture, well, the transitions uh, are considered to be degenerate with transition dipole moments of uh, the same magnitude. So when you combine uh, these transition dipole moments in, in phase and out of phase, well, what you obtain is actually a, a cancellation in one case and then a strong dipole moment in the other. So these two states are uh, this weak and uh, strong absorption band that is being seen in the, in the, in the absorption spectrum. So, so that's the way things uh, I found are being uh, uh, rationalized in the literature. And so uh, keeping this picture in mind, this uh, molecular orbital picture, well, uh, you start from the TTM. One thing you can put is another alternate group as a substituent that will not be neither donor or, or acceptor. But in doing so, well, you, you don't break the degeneracy and you should remain with a dark uh, system. But if you put a donor or an acceptor, now uh, you, you break the degeneracy on, uh, of these transitions and the, the lowest excited state here is dominated by homosumo in the case of donor and somolumo in the case of the acceptor. And because uh, you don't have any more this degeneracy uh, between the, the, of the two transitions, then this permits you to, to have some transition dipole moment and uh, radiative rate. So, so that's uh, how these systems that I show you that are being used actually at the moment in, in uh, devices, th this is the way uh, the, the properties of these systems uh, are, are rationalized. So we decided to have uh, a goal, like a computational goal, to try to understand what is the physics, or like uh, what is going on actually, like a physical interpretation uh, beyond this molecular orbital picture of what's going on in uh, TTM and TTM uh, derivatives. So we started uh, by studying this um, naked radical, the, the, just the TTM uh, unsubstituted, and we had a look at the low-lying uh, electronic states. And so uh, what, we, what we obtained was a pair of degenerate states. 
uh, here with a very low oscillator strength, but could be assigned to this weak absorption band. And at higher energy, we have a pair of uh, another pair of degenerate state with significant oscillator strength that uh, could be uh, that can be associated to this uh, to this band. And if we look at the the, the transitions uh, describing this excited state, when the first thing we see is that we don't recover this uh, this uh, alpha and alpha uh, contribution of of uh, homo somo and somo loom as the first thing. And then if we look at the uh, the molecular orbitals that are uh, involved in this in this uh, excited state, so here we have uh, the somo with the contribution on the on the radical center. Uh, but also we see that uh, all these orbitals are pretty delocalized onto this, uh, what I call the ligands, so these three chlorophenyl rings uh, connected to the central carbon atom. So in the first place, we decided to have a look at, at the, the, the interaction of this ligand with the, with the central carbon atom. And to do so, we took a, a, a model system. So uh, we basically take the TTM, we removed some of the chlorine atom to avoid uh, steric clashes in the, the systems we're going to generate. And then we put the ligands uh, completely perpendicular to the plane uh, formed by these uh, atoms and that contain the, the radical center. We put it to uh, 90 degree, and then we slowly decrease uh, the, the, this dihedral angle value so as to planarize uh, the system. And so when you do this, uh, we can have a look at the, the, the evolution of the energy of the molecular orbitals of the system. And we see that the HOMO and LUMO are barely affected, but uh, the SOMO is strongly destabilized while the SUMO is strongly stabilized. So at the end, the, the HOMO-SUMO transition and SOMO-LUMO uh, uh, will, uh, will decrease in energy. And this is uh, something you can trace back when you look at the uh, evolution uh, with the, the dihedral angle of the vertical transition energy of both the dark and the bright states, which are both uh, decreasing. Now, when we have a look at the evolution of the uh, oscillator strength, we don't have uh, uh, such uh, completely nice picture, but we see that starting from completely forbidden transition, uh, when the, the orientation is completely perpendicular, by, uh, by slowly decreasing this dihedral angle and planarizing the system, we see that uh, both uh, oscillator strength are increasing, although of course here it's uh, very little. And this tells us that basically the possibility of having uh, transition dipole moments that are not, uh, not zero uh, comes from the fact that you have an interaction between the, the, the pi system of the ligands and the, the radical center here. But one thing that remains is that uh, if we look at the oscillator strength of this uh, low lying state, well, it remains uh, pretty dark. So this does not give us so much more insight onto the, this darkness of the TTM radical. So, so the question remained for us, like why TTM is such a weak emitter? And to, to try to, to understand this and give, yeah, a, a, a rationalization of, of uh, what's what's happening and get some physical meaning to what's happening. Uh, what we did is to uh, decompose the eigenstate uh, of the electronic Hamiltonian into a set of states that would have a, a well-defined character. And so the way this is done is uh, called uh, use, is using uh, what is called the diabetization procedure. We use the Boyce algorithm, but uh, in in simple words, uh, what's happening is that. We take the, uh, the, the electronic states and allow them to mix uh, using a rotation matrix that is uh, determined uh, in this case, using this algorithm uh, by maximizing the transition dipole moment between pairs uh, of boy states. So boy states, I call them like this, but these are the, this state with a well-defined physical uh, character that we try to generate. And so once you, you do this, where well, you can express your uh, eigenstate as a linear combinations of these new states that you have generated that uh, have uh, physical meaning. And so you can give uh, a physical meaning to, to your, your uh, eigenstate here. So when you do this, well, you obtain a, a, a new Hamiltonian, what I call here the Boyce Hamiltonian. So on the diagonal, you have the energy of your, of your Boyce state and uh, off diagonal, you have the coupling between uh, this state. 
So the first thing we did was to look at uh, what is the nature of, uh, of uh, this, uh, these two pairs of state. And what we see uh, doing a charge analysis is that these states are actually charge transfer state. So the lowest energy one called here LC are ligand to uh, central carbon charge transfer state, and the higher energy one are ca central carbon to uh, ligand charge transfer state. Also, what we see mm -hmm. is that these states are strongly uh, interacting uh, by pair. So in the following, uh, because uh, the, the lowest uh, doublet that we're interested in, well, can be uh, written as a linear combination of all the state, uh, we will first like focus on, on just uh, one pair of state. So let's focus on uh, the, the, this uh, LC and CL state, and let's have a look at the transition dipole moment. And if we do this, what we see is that the transition dipole moments of this state are uh, collinear, but uh, with uh, opposite orientation. So what happens is that the, the D1 is coupling the transition dipole moment in an anti-parallel -par way, which results in the partial uh, cancellation. And actually, the cancellation is only partial because these uh, two contributions are not uh, degenerate. And so to understand this simply, well, if we had a degenerate state, so if all of the state were at, at this energy value, let's say, well, we will express the, the D1 as an half and half combination of the two. So the, the dipole moment will perfectly cancel. But in the case uh, here, it's arbitrary numbers, but the, but the two uh, energies are, are different. The states are not degenerate anymore. Then the relative weight of the contribution is different in, the, in our combination. Uh, of the, the this uh, D1 state, and so you have only this uh, partial cancellation. So uh, th this basically tells us that uh, by modifying the extent of mixing of these two contributions, the relative weight of this uh, in the linear combination, uh, we could uh, enhance the oscillator strength of uh, the TTM uh, radical. And so uh, using a model Hamiltonian in which uh, we can change the values uh, of this, of this, uh, the energies of the state. Uh, well, we, we've been uh, playing a bit around and see uh, how goes the evolution of the oscillator strength as a function of the uh, difference in energy between these two charge transfer uh, contribution. And so, if we start here uh, at zero, so the states uh, are degenerate. We have perfect cancellation, as I said, and then you have zero uh, oscillator strength. But in the case of, uh, of TTM, well, we don't have to generate uh, states. And so non-zero oscillator strength is the value that we get when, you, when we do the TD, TDDFT, TDA, DFT calculation uh, for, this, uh, for this system. And so if we uh, extend this to a, a larger range of, uh, of energy, what we see is that as the difference in energy between the two charge transfer contribution increases, then uh, so does the oscillator strength. Uh, we also applied this uh, model to the uh, at the D1 geometry because like, this is uh, the geometry from where the emission uh, should take place. And in that case, we, uh, we observe the same trend, of course, but with uh, systematically higher values because at the D1 geometry, we have uh, already some um, localization of the excitation. We have already some breaking of the symmetry, further breaking of the symmetry of uh, these two uh, contributions. So in practice, how one uh, can do well, to, to maximize, let's say, or to increase the difference uh, between these two, well, given that the ligand to uh, central carbon atom uh, states are the lower in energy, uh, we can think that putting uh, an atom that is more donor than the chlorine uh, should uh, stabilize this, uh, this contribution and then uh, increase the oscillator strength and so by extension, instead of just an atom, one could think that putting a donor, uh, a donor substituent should also uh, favor the increase of the oscillator strength. So what we did in the following is to uh, study a range of uh, substituted uh, TTM radical. Uh, and here, uh, these are the, the different uh, systems that we investigated. And first, we started by just replacing uh, the, the chlorine atom with a nitrogen. Uh, so we, we sort of uh, further break the, the symmetry of the system. And uh, when we look at the evolution of the molecular uh, orbitals, so what we see is like a small destabilization of both uh, of, 
all of them actually, uh, but in such a way that is uh, symmetric and at the end, the transition energy remains uh, the same. There is no shift in the transition energy. However, we see a, a slightly smaller oscillator strand and this goes uh, well with the fact that like, keeping in mind the model we've just shown uh, that the donorability of hydrogen is power than the one of, of a chlorine atom. Uh, next, we have substituted the TTM radical with uh, an acceptor. And in that case, well, the, the, the radical is playing the role uh, of, the, of the donor. So you have a somolumo transition instead. Uh, and we see uh, um, a strong decrease uh, of the lumo, like a stronger effect in the stabilization of the lumo than the sumo, which translates into uh, a redshift of the vertical transition. But here, uh, well, even though normally like one should expect that we could have a, a larger oscillator strength, well, it doesn't go, um, it doesn't go with the correct expected trend. And we, we, we still have an oscillator strength that is uh, pretty low. So that might be something to investigate why. Um, but what is complicated is that I haven't found any, uh, any radicals substituted by an acceptor system in the literature. So uh, I didn't find any experimental data. And there is not so much uh, being done on uh, acceptor substituted radical uh, so far. Then uh, we moved on to put uh, instead a, a donor uh, substituent. So we put this uh, NH2 group. And uh, here, what we see is that we have um, a strong uh, destabilization of the LUMO. Uh, so here we have uh, this uh, redshift of the vertical transition. And so uh, here we know that the, the donor will uh, further, uh, further stabilize this ligand to a charge transfer a contribution. And this is, this is what we see. And we have this. Uh, higher oscillator strength, uh, and we also uh, see it in the in the larger electron hole radius that we compute. And then a further way to tune the the, the properties of the of the like the photophysics and the properties of the d1 state is uh, to increase basically the distance between uh, the the radical center and the the donor group. So we we also increase the effective conjugation. So here in between the donor and the radical, we put uh, uh, a phenyl group. Uh, we put one and then we put two actually. So this is the system with only uh, one, uh, one phenyl ring. So we have uh, um, an, a further destabilization of the, of the homo level that translates into a redshift, like a quite strong redshift with respect to uh, what we had in, in TTM. Uh, and also what we, what we observe is that we have this uh, increase uh, in oscillator strength, but in the case of, uh, of, of this guy where we have the two, uh, two phenyl rings, well, actually we don't have an increase anymore. And this is due to the fact that, uh, okay, you, you pull the, the, the hole and electron apart and you have this, this shift and you have this donor group that, uh, that should give you this high oscillator strength. But in this case, uh, we see that the, the, um, the orbital overlap is vanishing. So there is a, a compromise to find. Uh, also, you cannot just uh, separate uh, more and more to, to stabilize this uh, ligand to central carbon uh, atom contribution. And so, well, on this, that's, uh, that's all for what I wanted to say. And thanks to the IPC and Gipuzkoa for the, for the funding and you for your attention. Thank you very much, Claire, for this nice presentation. So it's open for discussions. I'm curious about knowing what level of theory are you using to describe these excitations? In all of them. Oh, yes. <laughs> choice. <laughs> well, uh, TDDFT, you know, like the cages are pretty big. So like already, or I don't know, depending on the kind of calculations you do, but for me, Already, it was a pretty heavy calculations, and uh, for the radical is also uh, because this diabetization procedure is only implemented using uh, TDA DFT at least so far. But I know I don't know, <laughs> but uh, but that's also one of the reasons. Uh, and also, we were not like so interested in uh, reproducing uh, exactly 
like the, the experimental data that we actually didn't really have. <laughs> That's but, a, my, this is my question because I, I, I'm curious about knowing how good the agreement in your pick positions and things like that when you compare with experiments can be. Well, for the TTM radical, uh, I actually didn't even really compare. Like the trends are, are correct, then the absolute value, I, I didn't compare this because we first wanted to get well, basically an understanding of, of what's going on uh, in the in the system. I like get a, a picture of the photophysics and, and, and a physical meaning of why it was dark beyond uh, this molecular orbital picture. So, so yes. And, and for the cage, well, I think it's the same, like the trends are similar, but I didn't do like a benchmark of 50 functionals to try to <laughs> fit the experimental value. But we always cared that uh, like, we have uh, the trends uh, are relatively good. Okay. okay. I have a question. Can you show that slide where you were playing with the angle? Yeah, that one. So there you are not including the chloride atoms, right? Yes, because not, well, when you, you reach not... 30 degrees, then it's a bit uh, complicated to put them so close to each other. So I decided to remove them. Okay, because I was um, so I was asking myself whether it would be so easy to rotate if you have the chloride atoms there. No, yeah. I, and well, I, in principle, the exact system does have the chloride yes, systems. But, but, but if you look at the, I mean, basically the, the photophysics properties do not come from the presence of, of the, of the chlorine atoms. It's more like uh, the interaction between the, the ligands and the radical center. And somehow these chlorine atoms are, uh, um, are basically inf enforcing, I would say this uh, structure because they create this uh, bulkiness, but the, the system adopts uh, this conformation. But, but here being this like a toy model to see what's going on, mm -hmm. well, that was like uh, sufficient, but yes, if you have the chlorine atom, well, you don't go to thirty. Like it gets really planar, and okay, yeah. because I think if I understand you well, it's you are trying to fight two, let's say, counter effects. One is protecting the radical; you need the yes. chloride atoms to yes. be there, but at the same time, you are fighting the delocalization of the yes of the, yes, of the yes. radical because that's yeah, what yeah. will change your. Well, yeah, it, it was it was somehow to understand like. Um, like basically, yeah, the, the importance of of, uh, of the interaction of the the radical electron uh, with the ligand, but also to see, yeah, like how the oscillator strength will evolve. Because like in the beginning, I was a bit exploring what was going on. Like, why is it so dark? I don't know. Well, let's play around uh, and see that nothing changes. But okay, <laughs> but at least yeah, we learn about uh, like why the about the, inter the, the interaction in the system and what happens when you don't have any interaction and so on. But it is kind of more like a toy model to mm -hmm. unrealistic toy model, like chemically unrealistic, let's say. <laughs> yeah. More questions? Ali? So in, in the way you were introducing the, the second part of your talk, you were uh, uh, mentioning this uh, molecular orbital. Uh, picture that was uh, being used to like interpret some mm -hmm. experimental evidence on these uh, yes. uh, molecules. Uh, what I didn't entirely get is like from your results. Yes. What's what's the new like interpretation of the? Well, you the... get a physical meaning of what's going on, but it's like you have this charge transfer contribution in your system that uh, cancel each other, which is which is not so. I mean, here you get a. Uh, uh, molecular orbital picture, which is also something that I, I did not get from the calculation and I didn't see in any of the work reported so far. Uh, basically this, this picture, I haven't seen it from any uh, calculation reported. So this gives you a way to rationalize what's going on, but you, you don't get any uh, physical meaning. So, so how would you know like uh, how, how to change the substituent or what to change in the substituent to achieve uh, better uh, luminescence, for instance. Well, okay, let's put something down now. So it goes this way or this way, the molecular orbital, but you don't have uh, the, the physics behind. So in this case, we were able to, uh, to rationalize 
the fact that you have this charge transfer contribution and how you can modify and tune uh, the extent of mixing of this charge transfer contribution uh, to, to basically change the photophysics of, of, the, of the system. And, and in particular, just the study of the radical alone but there is also not so much work, like all the theoretical work I could find was on the directly donor acceptor system, but more in terms of uh, the calculation of radiative rates and so on. But there, is, there, there hasn't been work uh, in this direction. And also as far as the first step, basically into the, the world of organic radicals. And so I uh, was to get a good understanding of, of what was going on. Uh, so, yes. Maybe I don't, I don't know if it's scientifically feasible, but let's say when you take the DTM, let's say molecule, what if you replace a benzene with triazine or something else that breaks completely the symmetry? Yeah, yeah, I don't know about the. That's the problem also to play with toys because I don't know how chemically possible it is. But uh, I mean, I don't know. At least I can say that in the literature I haven't find any. Anything exotic like uh, <laughs> synthesis so it's mostly these two guys and donor substituent but okay who knows maybe some guys are already playing trying to do it but uh yes i don't know i mean there are plenty of things that you could think about yeah changing the nature of these rings or even putting like uh, several radicals together like i don't know there are many things but then what is uh, chemically possible like practically i don't know yes and do you think it will change something if you change some chloride by some iodide? Because maybe that's uh, yes, possible also, to do synthetically. Uh, yeah, I, I think probably there are some if a bulkier atom yes, and yes, yes. changes the polarity. Uh, so yeah, probably. Like uh, and probably there is something that has been done. I guess maybe with the PTM radical changing the chlorine by something else, but now I don't remember. But yes. Yeah, that is probably more reasonable too. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fantasy. For the organic chemist, yeah. <laughs> yes. So do we have any more questions? Okay, if that's not the case, let's thank Claire again for the nice talk. It's always difficult to rationalize. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I think because that's, that was the thing, like I was trying to understand the system, but, but then I did calculation and then 